recorded presentation from the Heart to Heart Bible study titled God Judges Rightly, a study through 1 Samuel chapters 16 through 31. More information about this study is available on our website at www.refugefamily.com. I'm excited that we're in this chapter. I'm excited that God is doing a new thing and that he's brought you here tonight. He has you right where he wants you to be. You, he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's in control, and we don't have to sweat it. Okay? Thou shalt not sweat it. That's the way, that's a, our word for today. Our word for today. And so, uh, Lord Jesus, um, I, I do pray even after that wonderful prayer that we just had. Lord, I do pray as we look into your word, Father, that you would just um, cause us to hear the things that you want us to hear. Lord, uh, cause me to speak the things that you want spoken. Lord, keep anything of myself away from my mouth. Lord, just um, we want to speak your words. I want to speak your words. And Lord, um, we recognize that you are here, that your Holy Spirit is walking amongst us. Lord, we want to recognize that and know that you are um, you are in complete control, and that it is true that there is no weapon formed against us that will stand. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, could I just ask you guys to be praying for a lady named uh, Judy McAleese? She is, uh, they're wanting to move her from her um, nursing home. She's part of our morning study. Uh, they're wanting to move her from the nursing home to UCLA because she's having some more problems and maybe is facing some more surgery. So if you guys would pray for Judy, that would be uh, really great, and we really want to do that. So as we get into chapter 17, um, it tells the first uh, seven verses tell all about Goliath. And this whole, we, we're not going to go into all of that. We're not even going to cover those first seven verses because this story is not about Goliath. But this story is not really about David either. It's the story of David and Goliath, but it's about Jesus. And so we want to get into it tonight and not waste any time. So we'll move on. But I want to show you a little idea. And if you guys have been, uh, probably most of you have looked up this man. Uh, he is the, uh, was the tallest he was the biggest, tallest uh, human being ever. He was 8 foot 11.1 inches tall. Um, uh, look, he was 8 feet 11.1 inches, so almost 9 feet tall. Um, look him up on your own. His name is Robert Wadlow, W-A-D-L-O-W. Um, and you can get some more information on him. It said that he was also very strong, and that he weighed 490 pounds. Uh, they say when he died at 22, had he uh, continued to live, he would have continued to grow because of the disease that he had. Uh, not really a disease, but it had to do with the pituitary gland and um, the growth hormone that it was putting out. So um, this is another picture a little bit later on. Again, that's his father standing there um, right next to him. And <laughs> um, can you imagine saying, stop it? You can't go out tonight. Yes. <laughs> it, would be, it would have been an interesting time, I am sure. But just to get an idea of what it is, uh, that was probably, his dad's size is probably about the size of David. David would have been shorter than Saul. Uh, so um, that's what he was looking at, that David was looking at someone that size. So just so that you get a picture of that, and uh, we know... Um, that God is in control, right? So, um, but along with that, so he died at age 22. What do you think brought down a man that size? It wasn't the flu. It didn't have anything to do with his size. It was a blister. 
His uh, brace was on one day and it caused a little blister. He didn't take care of the blister and it caused an infection and the infection killed him. And that's a reminder to us to take care of the little blisters in our life. Those little things in our life, that's no big deal. You know, it hurts a little bit, but that's that little bit of sin that we allow to be in our lives. Let's deal with it now and be done with it and prevent that infection from spreading throughout our, ba our body and eventually killing us. So that is a really good thing for us to remember. Um, why do we have this story in the Bible? It is here because the scriptures speak of who Jesus is and what he came to do. It's important for us to remember that the Old Testament is but a shadow of the New Testament. They go together. It's important that we study both Old Testament and New Testament and look for Jesus throughout the Old Testament. That's what this whole story is about, is about Jesus. It's important for us to remember that. You remember about uh, Jesus after he rose from the dead in uh, Luke 24. 32, he's walking along the road to Emmaus with his disciples, and they don't even recognize who he is, but there he is walking with them. And later when they realized who he was, they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as, they op as he opened up the scriptures concerning himself? What scriptures was he opening up? He was opening up Old Testament scriptures talking about the things in the Old Testament. It's important for us to know that this whole Bible speaks of Jesus, Old Testament and New Testament. It all speaks of Jesus. So let's keep our eyes open through this study to see that very thing. And so we, we saw in the, the, those first seven verses that we're not going to go over. We're just going to start with verse 8. And then he stood and he cried out to the armies. Who's, who, who are we talking about? Goliath at this point. He stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? I'm not, am I not a Philistine? And you are the servants of Saul. First mistake. They were not the servants of Saul. They were the army of the living God. He made the first mistake as he looked at him as servants of Saul, servants of a man. And he chose a man for, you choose a man for yourselves and let them come down to me. Let them come down to me, okay? He is able to, if he's able to fight me and kill me, then uh, we'll be your servants. But if I prevail, then uh, you will be our servants. And the Philistine said, I defy by the armies of God of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul heard, uh, Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. They were dismayed, they were greatly afraid afraid. In number in verse 9, he's made a promise to them. If you are able to kill me, uh, we will be your servants. But if I'm able to kill you, then you will be uh, my servants. So there is the promise in verse 9. Then in verse 11, we find that they are dismayed and they are greatly afraid. In verse 12, now David was the son of, and it tells all about him, where he came from. He's the son of Jesse. Verse 13 talks about his three older brothers, and uh, you can get into those on your own time. Uh, you probably did while you were doing your homework, got into their names a little bit more, but we don't have time to cover what their names mean. I love to know what these names mean. There are other things in this chapter I want to go into in detail, but we just don't have the time tonight to cover all these verses and be able to do that. David was the youngest and the three oldest followed Saul. Now, you had to be at least 20 years old to join the army. That's why David was out tending the sheep. You had to be at least 20 years old um, to join the army. So he was out taking care of his father's sheep, just like our great shepherd is doing right now. 
taking care of his father's sheep. Um, David, as you remember, went to Saul to play music for Saul, but Saul was busy out on the battlefield, so there was no need for David to stay at Saul's place or at the palace, whatever it was called at that particular time. And so we move on, and we find that uh, David occasionally went up there, which we already said, and Phil the Philistine drew near, so Goliath drew near, and he presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. Now, the number 40 always signifies judgment. There were 40 days of uh, uh, 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, uh, Jesus was um, tested for 40 days out in the desert. Uh, the, it rained for 40 days. It was always a number of judgment. And so then Jesse said to his son David, so the father says, Go take your brother's bread. Go take them some food to eat, bring them some sustenance, and take it to them on the battlefield. And he brought them that sustenance. Bread was a big part of that. Do you see what's happening here? David is being guided <clears throat> by his father, actually, to the very place that he was meant to be. He's being guided by his father to the very place that he is meant to be because he needs to be in that place at that time. It looks like he's just taking bread. It looks like he's just taking things to his brothers. But no, God has a bigger plan. So don't worry about it in your own life when you think, I'm just going on. I'm just doing this. God has a plan, and he has you right where he wants you to be. So thou shalt not sweat it on that either. So God is faithful and he is faithful to fulfill his promises. So David is bringing food, in particularly he is bringing bread. In verse 18 it says uh, that he uh, took cheeses as well. And these are the things, I want to know why it says 10 loaves of bread. I want to know why it says 10 cheeses. I want to know why, but we don't have time to talk about that. So we'll just move on. And so he... Um, so he's bringing, David is bringing food, in particular, he's bringing bread to his brothers. Jesus was sent by his father with the fact that he himself was the bread of life in John 6, 48. He himself, he was sent by his father, just like David was sent by his father. He was carrying bread, David was carrying bread to the brethren, and Jesus was was the bread of life that he brought to his brethren. And so we move on into verse 19. Now Saul and they all and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning. I love that. He rose early in the morning. Isn't that the best time to rise? Isn't that the best time to be alive? Isn't that the best time to get with the Lord first thing in the morning? So yeah, so what if you, you wake up at the crack of 10? That's okay. It's first thing in the morning. It doesn't matter. Just get that time with the Lord first thing in the morning. And he left the sheep with a keeper. He left the sheep with a keeper. And that reminds us how the Holy Spirit was given to us. It reminds us when Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send the Holy Spirit to guide you and to be with you. He will be your comforter. And so Jesus would have sent that uh, them there. And uh, he took the things to, that Jesse told him. Um, that if, verse 21, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in the battle array. Verse 22, David left the supplies where he was supposed to. And then in verse 23, then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name. This is the first time his name is coming up. His name means exile. Um, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words, and David heard it. What were those same words? Those same words is, uh, if anybody can kill me, then I will serve you, but uh, my people will serve you, but if I kill you, you will serve me. So David hears this. He hears this going on in there. 
And when all of the men of Israel, when they saw the men, fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? You know, they're talking to David, I think, at this particular time. Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich, he will, he will enrich with great riches. He will give him a bride, and he will give his father's house freedom or exemption from taxes in Israel. So he's going to give them a bride. He's going to give them riches. He's going to give them freedom. He's going to give them treasures. That was what was promised to them. And when Jesus came, he came for his bride. He came to set us free, and he let us know that we are his treasure. We are his treasure in Ephesians 1.18, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We are his treasure. Do you realize, ladies, that you are a treasure? When was the last time you looked and went, do you see me? I am a treasure. I, I don't, I'm not sure that I have ever done that in my life except up here right now when I just said that. God looks at us and he says, you are my treasure. You are my treasure. You belong to me. You're in my family. I love you. And so that's what he was going to bring to them. And we'll just move down to verse 26. Then um, David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? What, you know, I, I didn't quite hear. What was it that you said was going to happen to the guy that did this? So let, will you say it to me again? But then he goes on to say, but wait, this guy, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Can you see David right now? I love, I love getting these pictures in my mind of what he must, who, who does this guy think he is? Are you kidding me? And you guys are backing off from him? What's, you don't see him accusing the brethren. Do you? You don't, say, you don't see him saying that, which I just said. What's wrong with you guys? You, you, you're, you're, you're fearful. What's wrong with you? He just said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Just who does he think he is? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, so shall it be done for the man who kills him. So Whatever we just said to you, that's what's going to happen. That's what the king said was going to happen. And then in verse 28, we see Eliab, or Eliab, uh, his brother, being really upset with him. What are you doing here? Oh, David, here you are again in the midst of everything, bringing attention to yourself. You're the youngest. Of course, dad always liked you best. We all know that. Here you are in the middle of everything. What are you doing here? And what does David say? David said, now what? Now what have I done? Now what are you accusing me of? I've done nothing. Um, is there any cause for this? And then David, we see David turning around toward the men, and they, he asked them the same question again. So what's going to be done for the guy that, that kills this guy? So David's brother is mad at him for being there. David was scorned by his brothers. He was scorned by his brothers. He was set aside. He was rejected. Jesus was rejected by his brethren as well. In John 1, 11 through 13, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. You see, it's all about Jesus here. Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported to him them to Saul, and he sent uh, then Saul sent for him. Then David said to Saul, can you say, okay, this guy's probably a little bit taller than me. Okay, he's probably about 18, 19, maybe 17, young guy. He said, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. You don't worry, I got this. Here's this little guy. And Saul said to David, you're not able to do this. You can't go against this Philistine because you're, you're just a youth. 
you're a nobody. You're a nothing. You can't do this. But you see, David remembered who he was in Christ. And we need to remember who we are in Christ. He knew who he was. David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and he goes into the whole story. He explains that um, what had happened and how he had fought off the lion, and he fought off the bear, and he killed them, and he took care of the sheep. You see, David was strengthened by experience. He was strengthened by experience. He knew what to do when these situations came up. He knew what was going on. Jesus was strengthened by his experience as well. You see, he was tempted by everything that you were tempted by. Everything. He was tempted for 40 days in the desert. Remember, 40 being the number of judgment. So Jesus understands. He understands because he's been tempted by everything that you have been tempted by. Hebrews 4.15, everything. Well, you go... Well, yeah, well, that wasn't even invented that day for him to be tempted by it. But does it not fall under a bigger category that he was tempted on those same issues? So he knows what you're going through. He knows your temptation. In verse 37, moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, okay, you go on. Go ahead, kid. Get killed. Go ahead. But you see the faith of David. You see that faith that David had there. And then, uh, so uh, Saul goes on and he tr tries to clothe David. And he puts on all of this armor in verse 39, the sword and all of the things there. And David said... <laughs> I can't do this. Can you see, David? He's got the armor on. Oh, this helmet. This helmet. Whoa, whoa, the helmet. Oh, it's okay, okay, okay. I'm going to, I, 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 no, 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 can't do it. Got to take the armor off. He set the armor aside. He set the armor aside. His own choice. No one took it from him. He set it aside of his own choice. The armor was rightfully his, but he set it aside, uh, uh, choosing rather to use what was tested, what he knew to be true. Jesus set aside what was rightfully his as well. He set aside his divine power. He set aside his armor of divine power. Okay, so if Jesus, when he came to the earth, set aside his divine power, how did he do all of the things that he did when he was on the earth? The same way you and I do. He depended on the power from his father. He depended on the power from his father. Philippians 2, 6 through 8, he took on the form of a bondservant, made himself of no reputation, taking on the likeness of man. And so we move down then into verse 40, and we see that David is taking those, uh, the smooth stones. He's getting the five smooth stones. And I don't know, um, I, I've heard it said that he picked up five because the, uh, Saul had brothers and he was going to take on the whole thing. I don't know if that's true. I just know that he, it says that he picked up five smooth stones. He got himself ready with what he was familiar with. And so the Philistine came and began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he hated him. And he said, you're just a kid. You're ruddy and you're good looking. Wait, how, why does this keep coming up? Is this some temptation, maybe? I, I, what, what is going on here? Why does this keep coming up in here? I want to know. I don't know. I don't know. I just know that here I see it again. And it's in, in response to what Goliath is uh, about to do. And so the Philistine said to David, I'm a dog that you come to me with sticks. And he cursed him by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me. 
and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Can you see him saying it? Can you say, do you know who I am? You just see my size? You see my size? I'm going to kill you. What do you got to say about that? And what does David say about that? Looks can be deceptive. You come to me with a sword, and I got to do this. You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And I think he pointed his finger at him. <laughs> I think he did that probably like this, but he pointed it nonetheless. The Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied this day. I'm telling you what's going to happen this day. Let me tell you what's going to happen. You want to know what's going to happen this day? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen this day. Right this day, right now, right now, where we stand, Okay, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and I will take your head from you. I want you to know that. I ain't kidding. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know what? That there is a God in Israel. Your stupid gods they are nothing. I am going to kill you. We'll see who be doing the killing tonight. That's what he said. Then all this assembly shall know, David is still talking, that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Whatever you're going through right now, Whatever it is, the battle belongs to the Lord. It's his. It belongs to him. And he is going to give you into my hands. He's going to give you into my hands. Do you know? You see? You see who me? You see in me? So it was. When the Philistine arose and he came and he drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He starts running to them, running right up in front of them. David didn't even look at the size of the problem. He ran toward it in the power of the living God. It was the power of the living God that did it. What if we faced our problems in that same way? What if we ran in the power of the living God, and carried the same faith that David had, that, belong, that the battle belongs to the Lord. I know he's going to deliver you to me. God told me. Do you know who I am? I am a son of the living God. I am a daughter of the living God. Enemy, you don't want to mess with me, because I'll call Jesus on you, and you don't have a chance We run toward the problem when we run to our knees. We are running toward the problem when we run to our knees. And we run to prayer, and we give it to God, and we find out his direction. Then we know exactly where we're supposed to go, how we're supposed to do it, in what direction are we supposed to be. Maybe I'm just supposed to be sitting here right now and letting the enemy think about it because there is deadness for him. That's the way it's going to be. Can you imagine what David's brother, remember the one that was so angry with him? Can you imagine as he saw his brother running toward this situation? Could you see the look on his face? Can you hear his thoughts? The last time I spoke to my brother, I was mean to him. I acted like I hated him, and now he, he's going to die. Here he is, and they're watching, and everybody's watching. Who's this kid? Who is this little guy that's running up there? And so as we go on and uh, move into this, um, what did their face look like? Was he concerned about that last time that he spoke to him? 
that David was probably going to die. Okay, imagine their faces as David runs toward Goliath. Astonishment. Then David put his hand in his bag, and he took out a stone, and he slung it, and he struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. He fell on his face to the earth. You know what? I made a mistake this morning because I said, I think he fell backwards, but no, he fell on his face. Now I have to correct everything. It would have worked so well if he fell backwards. But it, he didn't fall backwards. He fell on his face. It says so right there. So he fell on his face. It went into his forehead. Went into his forehead. Into. That's tough, dude. Hmm. Imagine the faces of the brothers and those in the other army, the astonishment that's on their face, it's the same face we have when we watch the miracles of the living God. When we watch guys, what, what do you think they did? Uh, oh, but, but, oh. Can you see it happening? He's, he's running, he's running toward, oh my goodness. Did you see him fall? Hmm. And so, David was strong in faith. He ran toward the fight. Jesus was strong in faith. In Mark 9, 31, he said, I will rise again. You can be sure of it. I will rise again. And so David prevailed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. And there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, remember, because he left it behind. And so, therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine. Here he's running. I, I got him. I got him. I got him. And then he goes, I don't have, what am I going to do? I said I was going to take his head. How am I going to do that? Well, in his own strength, he'd be pulling out that sword. Remember how heavy that sword is? You looked at it in the first, chap in the first part of the chapter, the, the weight of that sword. And he, in his own strength, he'd be, okay, yeah, I can, I can, okay, okay. I can. That's what happens in our own strength. What happens in God's strength? <laughs> Done. And that's what God calls us to do. Sorry, what God calls us to do with that sin in our life. When the enemy comes in and he directs us in a direction. Pull off the sword of the spirit, chop it, and done with it. That's it. The next time you're in a situation, I'm gonna see some, some hands going like that. I expect to see that next Sunday when I see you guys around here. You're going to do it because we are victorious. We are victorious. We are as victorious as David. David used the enemy's weapons against the enemy. He cut off his head. He could, e he could, whew, wore me out. How, <laughs> cutting off that head just wore me out. How could he even pick up that sword? But we talked about that. It was the power of the living God. Jesus used the weapon, the enemy's weapon, against the enemy as well. Satan thought that Jesus was on that cross, and Satan thought he had won. He thought, oh, I got this. Little did he know that Jesus used that very weapon formed against him to redeem the people, to obtain his treasure, his bride, his riches. The very instruments of the enemy, the weapons of the enemy, Jesus used to obtain his treasure, his bride, and his riches. So with this whole story, this whole story is about how David singularly by himself secured the victory. Did any of you, my, my grandkids, every one of my grandkids, there has been a time when they said, I do it myself. And I think we've done that ourselves, haven't we? I can do it myself. David did it by himself. There was nobody backing him up. You didn't see any brothers running up behind him. I just, I, I just amazed at that picture of him running up to David 
or to Goliath. But Goliath said, send a man down. But David, you remember, was sanctified. He was set apart by the Spirit. He was anointed by the Spirit of God and with oil by Samuel. You remember that happening not too long ago. Jesus singularly secured the victory. He was the one who was sent down from heaven that we might have eternal life. Jesus said, it is finished. It's finished. It's done. Jesus, you remember, was sanctified. He was set apart. He was anointed with oil when he was just a baby, anointed for the work that was set before him. And he was anointed and sanctified by his Father. The battle belongs to the Lord. And so now the men of Israel, verse 52, and uh, Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron and wounded the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to uh, that other place, even as far as Gath and Ekron. And then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents and they took stuff home. They had the spoils of war. What happened with those spoils of war? Just like in this story here, all partook of the spoils of war, even of those who were keepers of the stuff. You know who the keepers of the stuff are? When we, they are the ones that stay behind and make sure everything's okay. They are the ones, when we're up at retreat, they are the ladies that are down here at the bottom of the t- retreat that are praying for us up there. They are the ones who stay behind to defend those who are in the middle of the battle. And you know what? The reward is the same. We all get the spoils of war because we're a part of the war, even the keeper of the stuff. And David took the head of the Philistine, brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. He left, he left the armor in his tent. He left the Goliath's armor in Goliath's tent. When Saul saw David going out against the Philistines, he said to Abner, I don't know who this guy is. Would you find out who he is for me? And the king went, and, and so the king said, inquire whose son he is. He inquired Abner, uh, and then Abner brought him to the king uh, with, the, with uh, Saul, brought him to Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. I love that picture. And Saul said to him, whose son is he? Who can I bless? Who can I bring a bride to? Who can I bring riches to? Who can I bring um, freedom to? So you see, it's all about Jesus. This is David and Goliath, but about Jesus. Because that Old Testament being a shadow of who Jesus was going to be in the New Testament. David got noticed because of his faith in the living God. And that notice has now placed him right where he's supposed to be because of his faith. He's going to be king, but not until 2 Samuel. So we won't get to that. Let's let ourselves be noticed by the faith we have in the living God. Let's be women of faith. Let's remember that the battle belongs to the Lord, but I have responsibility. I need to run toward the fight but I run toward the fight on my knees before the Lord and I get his direction. And then I know, then I know what it's all about. And so, Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word today through David and Goliath, through this story that we've heard throughout the years, Lord. I thank you that you are the center of it, Lord, and that you will always be the center of it. Thank you, Lord, for redeeming us. Thank you for laying down your life for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you and we confess our sin. You are faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And all we have to do is ask. Just have to ask. And you cleanse us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the way that it ministers to us. I thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness toward us, your love for us.
your grace that you pour down on us, your grace that you in, instill in us, Lord. I thank you, Father, that you have given us all that we need to accomplish whatever you've called us to do. Help us to remember that, Lord, as we get into our small groups. Help us to minister one to another. Help us to know your word more. Help us to love you more, Lord, to seek you and to always love you as we are loved. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. <laughs> giving up, letting go, standing up, stepping out, walking on in the power of your name. I'm giving up, letting go. been a presentation of the Heart to Heart Women's Ministry at Refuge Calvary Chapel, Huntington Beach. For more information about this ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.